Okay, welcome to the Nova Associative uh, community. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce the speaker of today, uh, Professor Vladimir Kacho from the Linkoping University. The title of his talk is Some Questions on Obo Non Associative Algebra from the other important point of view. Please, Vladimir. Thank you, Salvatore. Thank you, organizers, for uh, giving me a an opportunity to have a talk. I asked the one almost in August, okay? So it's long ago here. Uh, so, but I explained, I, I planned some, something else, but then I a little bit changed my uh, intentions and now I, I try to explain why. So I hope it will be more or less uh, in, uh, talk about some elementary things around idempotence, which is more or less uh, an object in non strict algebra, which is most important for my point of view. Okay, I, I mean, in my study, okay, in my interests. And this talk uh, will be dedicated to my collaborator, Jakob Kersinov. Uh, he died last year in my so, uh, and we collaborated not so much uh, since 2016 from a conference uh, on Clifford algebras in Belgium. But, uh, and yeah, we, was, we were lucky to write uh, together a couple of papers and a third paper is not published and not submitted, it's not archived. Uh, yet because some uh, specific difficulties, because we had some ambitions to uh, achieve some big goals, but I think we have to be more modest. Anyway, so Yakov dreamed about what he uh, used to say, spectral synthesis, so to speak, how to recover an algebra structure from uh, idempotence. Uh, if you have some information about importance, the spectra, the fusion laws, something else. So how how to reconstruct an algebra in a reasonable way, uh, of course. So of course, this should be understood properly. And he posed some several, several questions during our collaboration. Some questions I deformed in some other directions. I try to explain uh, this point and how it influenced and uh, some result uh, we obtained. I never talk about that. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, since 2018 and 19, we published two papers, and I think they are more or less important. Uh, and actually, my intention is to draw attention to some questions because everything uh, rotates about some properties of idempotence over first over algebraically closed fields but then you want to expand this for any field and exactly there is a difficulty occur and i try to explain what is the difficulty why one can naturally expect that this should be working so here um, plan of my talk, I try to give uh, some short motivations and some uh, elementary facts about idempotence, their uh, usefulness outside algebra. Then I will come to the goal of my talk, generic algebras in some several reincarnations uh, and try to explain what physics uh, uh, is in generic algebras. Uh, this is what actually Yakov was dreamed for a long time. Uh, and I have to mention that we both come from uh, analytical society, community, okay? So we uh, were not educated as uh, algebraists. We both have analytical background. That's why we have some specific point of view on the subject. Then I will um, shortly discuss some interesting, from my point of view, questions about two-dimensional generics of algebras. 
and explain what I actually had an intention uh, for this talk when I uh, planned it in August. So I will uh, shortly explain how inner isotopes and uh, medial algebras comes, come to this context naturally. Okay, this is my plan. So let me just explain what I mean by, by properties in large and why this uh, uh, occur in this context. Actually, what I uh, have been studied before in differential geometry was actually geometry in large, which means that you don't study some local properties, which in principle are based on some um, infinitesimal analysis, but you want to have some global information. And here are some very well known examples. So for instance, if you compare this with differential geometry, so Gaussian curvature, it, this is the product of two principal curvatures. If it's positive, negative, zero, you can say in principle that uh, a surface is local, a flat, convex, or saddle. But uh, to have something more, you have to have some completeness. Uh, and so, for instance, uh, we have very nice formula, Euler polyhedron formula for a convex polyhedron. Here is a Euler characteristic. It can be arbitrary, but for convex uh, body, it is ex exactly equal to two. And what you know, you don't know what V, E, and F are. So the number of vertices, edges, and uh, faces in a concrete situation. But you know definitely that this uh, relation holds, OK? And this relation uh, helps somehow. It, it doesn't solve uh, all questions, but it helps. Uh, and here is differential geometric generalization of the same property. So you can go further and ask for any surface, not just polyhedron. Then you have to involve a Gaussian curvature. And if you integrate over a closed without a boundary uh, surface, then you obtain some specific number, again. Again, so you obtain some uh, learned characteristic of this closed surface. And you can compare this, for example, uh, I freely mentioned this as a uh, result in the large, for, for instance, from group theory. Class equation gives you some uh, explicit formula for the order of the group in terms of its classes, okay? So um, it's crucially, everything here crucially depends if you count everything in a sense. This is the point. If you miss something, if you miss, uh, if you have some uh, uh, set outside the polyhedron or surface, or you don't have any information here, you don't obtain this equality. So equality crucially depends on some completeness. Uh, <clears throat> so, you uh, okay, we go further, and now I come to uh, algebraic context. So the word, Idem important uh, stems from Latin words idem, idem, patent, which when put together means the same power. Okay, so normally one uh, explain it by equation something to the power of two or repeat it twice, it gives the same, gives the same. And uh, here our setting, we will work only in this talk, I will work only with commutative algebras over a field or field of characteristic not two. Two is forbidden because uh, it's, yeah, it will be very, very difficult to uh, explain some several facts about uh, uh, the importance, for instance, because two comes naturally in many equations, so to speak. Okay? And and I'd important, uh, everybody knows what does it mean. And two nil potent is, is non zero element satisfying this equation. It's just uh, nil potent element of order two. Yeah, okay, some elementary facts uh, everybody knows about that. The set of item potents will be denoted by this uh, sign. In what force I will write shortly x to the power two instead of x times x, if it's <clears throat> will be okay. 
From the analytic point of view, they are important to solve this equation. If we forget about uh, the uh, setting, if we just looking at this equation, uh, it's natural to think that this is either some fixed point or some solution. And then I can ask, for instance, how many solutions you can have, then it's natural you look at the differential at this point, uh, so to speak, implicit function theorem. And of course, you can expect and you should expect that properties of each item potent crucially depends on the differential of the x. Uh, so to speak, if we differentiate, we obtain the twice multiplication operator, L of x, this is multiplication by x, left multiplication, right multiplication is the same, minus the identity operator. This is exactly the, uh, the, the differential of this equation. So if it is non-degenerate, it works on one side. If it's degenerate, it uh, works on the other side, okay? So it crucially depends uh, what is the determinant of this map. And this map will be in focus in the following, okay? So I, I will just uh, recall uh, an easy observation that any one-dimensional subalgebra of a commutative algebra is spent either, either by an idempotent or tunipotent, okay? And here is a nice citat from Felix Agrian. He worked uh, much on uh, actual algebras and he wrote, in some ways, idempotents are also analogous to a sort of subalgebra of Lie algebras. This is not a new point, of course. There are some uh, similar ideas, ideas coming back to Nielsen in sixty segment, and I suspect to uh, even to many many answers. Okay. So I, I don't uh, pretend on the completeness, but I, I just show some uh, very shortly. I I, I, I would look, I, I will not stay in here, but here is a map of similarities between. Lee world and Jordan world. And so to speak, you have anti commutative world and commutative world uh, of non associative algebras. So, uh, the most interesting for me now will be here. Uh, on the Lee side, so you have something which is called uh, root diagrams. Uh, and uh, yeah, one can uh, understand this as, as a spectrum uh, with respect to certain operators. Uh, and on the Jordan Jordan side, so you have the spectrum of idempotence. And this red number one half is extremely important for understanding uh, classification of Jordan algebras here. Okay? And I will also talk about that. Okay? So um, I will not stay in here so much. I'm just talking it. Now I, I want to show some, uh, uh, also some motivations for the importance, why they are interesting for me also. Of course, this is a standard motivation as a projection operator, okay? So this is a standard. If you have an associative algebra setting, then any operator which uh, twice repeated gives the same, is an item potent and it is the, a classical idea of peers to reconstruct uh, the algebra by using uh, its item potents. Uh, so this is more or less inside algebra itself. But uh, there is some different uh, interpretation. Uh, the so-called essential potents in the so-called V algebra defined in the very famous 1962 paper of Eightfold Way by Gilman uh, in nuclear physics on symmetries of baryon semisons. Uh, it turns out that he already there, uh, yeah, it's more or less well known, okay. He used some uh, specific algebra. It's, uh, it's lies nearby to Jordan algebra okay? Uh, such that this physical equation, uh, of course, one, one start with some equation in uh, tensor terms uh, in a purely physical setting, and then one can interpret it as a multiplication in a certain algebra, such that this identity holds 
for some specific real constant eta. And everybody uh, understand here that you, if you normalize by eta q, then you obtain an eigenvalue, okay, up to minus. Uh, those essential deposits are important in uh, the so-called symmetry breaking uh, question. This is a very big uh, area. And in fact, mathematically, it means that uh, for certain uh, functional, which has homogeneous degree of C on a, some specific unit sphere on some representation. So you try to search uh, Lagrange equilibrium points. And uh, by analysis, this is equivalent to solving this equation. This is just to show uh, a graph of a cubic polynomial of higher degree of, yeah, in higher dimensions, uh, which can have either local maximum, minimum, or set of points. All those points correspond either to idempotence or to nilpotence in a corresponding algebra in the following way. So here is another uh, very nearby, uh, the so-called bifurcation equation with bilinear B considered by Settinger in 1977 uh, for a bilinear map. So uh, which is in invariant on the <clears throat> action of a certain group. Those two uh, lie more or less in the same class of questions and a general interpretation uh, can be done as following as follows. In general, a stationary point of a distinguished cubic form on an inner product space, so to speak, with some bilinear form. Uh, the rule multiplication in an algebra given by product of Hessian of a cubic form, which is linear with respect to x by y, induces a commutative algebra metrized structure on V. And the earlier homogeneous function theorem implies that this equation x times x uh, is actually up to one half is a gradient of this cubic form. And it comes back to this equation and this equation also, okay? So, so to speak, everything here is uh, different sides uh, of a definition of an either pattern in a commutative algebra, uh, which comes from some uh, distinguished cubic form. Okay. Yeah, uh, I have to mention also idempotence in actual algebras, which mimic distinguished finite subsets of involution in a certain group, generating a nice commutative algebra structure. Okay. Xs are some specific idempotence, which uh, satisfies some distinguished fusion laws or rules, which generates the whole algebra. Well, uh, some immediate questions here arise. As we have seen, the importance appears in several contexts outside the conventional area of non assistive algebra. One could expect that some corresponding analogous holds true for higher dimensional subalgebras. So uh, importance and tunnel importance are one dimension, okay? They play an essential role because they have some specific a, interpretation as uh, equilibrium points or stationary points. Uh, do one have some similar interpretation for, for instance, two-dimensional subalgebras or three-dimensional? Uh, it's natural to believe that uh, something uh, in this direction should be called. Okay? Uh, the number of importance in a commutative algebra in a generic situation is two to the power of dimension of this algebra. What is an expectable number of two-dimensional subalgebras of a commutative algebra in a generic situation? So we have an algebra of dimension n. We expect that for a, you know for a generic choice of an algebra, we have a predicted number of adipons. We have also some predicted number of subalgebras, but this should be counted uh, yeah, more harder, okay? I have no answer or no good ideas 
to this question, but there are some good examples that show that it could be interesting. I will show at the end of my talk. The spec of, I, of I importance in an associative algebra is quite simple. Zero and Y are the only spectral values for Jordan algebra is zero, one, half, and one. In general, the pure spectrum can be very variegated. Okay, so it can be very, very di di different. Okay, so each potent can have its own spectra. Uh, could one ex expect that 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 there are some abstractions for the spectrum of idempotents? Could be the spectrum completely arbitrary, and the answer is no, because there are some abstractions, and those what the Vizyakov called by Sizigis. So uh, let me just repeat the previous slide more formally, okay? If you start with uh, a commutative algebra, then you can just put any uh, structure coefficients gamma, and you can define the multiplication in the algebra just by freely choosing of these coefficients, okay? Uh, you have just to control that they are symmetric to get the commutative algebra. If you have an arbitrary algebra, you don't control this, okay? So uh, this explains that you have a very free choice for defining of a commutative and dimensional. Of course, if you have some identity, those uh, quantities should satisfy some additional things. But if you don't have so you still have a very, very big freedom. Uh, but the situation is quite different if you start with, not with n basis, but with some specific basis, or for instance, with item potency. Uh, one has to be careful. And the idea comes back to Segria in 1938, who interpreted item potency in a commutative algebra over complex numbers, it's important, or over algebraic closely field is a solution of a quadratic system, of course, okay, here. Uh, then uh, you can still, and when I met Yakov for the first time, she told me in 2016 that Duvladimir, you know that if you have, for instance, three at the importance in uh, two-dimensional algebra, then you cannot choose the spectrum freely. They have abstractions. Okay, maybe it's uh, more or less evident for everybody sitting here. I didn't know about that. Uh, and the formula is very nice. I will show you after a while. But interestingly, this can be generalized for an n-dimensional case. And this means that one has to be careful. You cannot freely uh, write multiplication table if you use idempotence and just put freely put some uh, coefficients. Those coefficients should be uh, should satisfy some Sizigis. So my first definition is uh, the following. Uh, we have a commutative algebra. We have an algebra idempotence C. It, this idempotence is called singular if the determinant of Two multiplication operator by C minus the identical operation uh, operator is equal to zero. It is exactly those uh, differential I wrote at the very beginning. Okay, two multiplication parts mi minus uh, I. Otherwise, C is a regular at importance, so to speak. This operator is this operator is invertible. Okay, you one one in principle in principle try to say more or less easily to say, okay, one can operate instead of determinant by with uh, eigenvalues and actually with eigenvalue one half, which is forbidden here. But uh, I want to have a definition which doesn't work with eigenvalues because you can work with any field and you cannot, you, you, you don't care about the existence of eigenvectors, eigenvectors. Uh, but determinant is well defined from the very beginning, okay? So this definition, more or less uh, in uh, this part, regular, was that Sebastian Walker using in 1999, 
in his paper on rank three algebras. And in his terminology, singular and importance are the importance of multiplicity two. And again, why? Because here is the differential and the differential is zero for two dimensional algebra means that the multiplicity of an important will be two. In high dimensional case, it Vladimir? Uh, yes, uh, so uh, some simple facts or some facts about a regular singular ad importance, the trivial ad importance, of course, zero ad importance are regular, okay? Uh, because they have a spectrum which doesn't include one half. Uh, so note that a singular ad importance, the number one half is always an eigenvalue because the determinant is zero. And this means that this equation is solvable for uh, one half. If you, uh, okay, one half is an eigenvalue of this multiplication operator, okay? So you have at least one eigenvector. But for a non singular important, the set of non trivial eigenvalues for one half or just eigenvalues, it is a big question. So you don't know whether they exist, for instance, okay, except for the trivial eigenvalue one, which is always existing, of course. So that's why uh, I define it by determinant, but not as eigenvalue one half, as for instance, what I can do. So uh, interesting, okay. So this operator, phi capital, it acts on the difference, I'd important difference uh, very nicely. Uh, if you act uh, by this operator, on a difference between the same C item potent minus another item important, you obtain the square. Okay, so this gives some interesting uh, consequences, but I will not discuss this in this talk. Okay, uh, item importance in associative algebra by definition are always regular because they have only uh, eigenvalue zero and one. Jordan algebra contains a regular ad importance, which is different from zero and the unit, if and only if the algebra is not simple. This is very well known, okay, because otherwise it splits. So uh, if the field is a complex or real number, then non singular or regular ad importance are always isolated points of the corresponding uh, multiplication map which uh, was studied by Segrea, I will uh, mention it after a while also. And the value one half, which appears here, over here, is distinguished for commutative algebras with identities. Uh, it was published in my paper from 2021, uh, distinguished in the sense that any algebra, any commutative algebra, over any field with a univariate, univariate identity must have the Pierce number one half. So to speak, uh, it is a priori uh, singular situation in this sense. If you don't have an identity, you can in principle hope that uh, the situation will be regular, so to speak, or nearby to be generic. The definition of generic algebra I will give uh, after a while. And it appears also important value for characterizing automorphism of actual algebra. I will mention this also. 
and other questions. I will skip them. Okay? So let me just uh, show a very elementary fact. Lemma one: If one have an idempotent in two-dimensional algebra, and you any vector which is non-collinear with C, then you have this equation: C by C is equal to C, and C by U can be written as here. Then this lambda here is independent of the choice of U, and it is in the idempotent spectrum. This is elementary. A linear algebra you can see just by the definition here because trace and determinant are invariant. So to speak, if you just write this equation in two-dimensional algebra, so you directly recover this lambda which is in uh, idempotent spectrum, and for any u it should be the same. This fact I will uh, play a little bit uh, now. So we have the first corollary, okay? So suppose we have a two-dimensional algebra, a two-dimensional algebra over any field of characteristic non-2, of course. So if we have three distinct non-zero idempotents in two-dimensional setting. Of course, this is exactly uh, the expected number because we expect to have at most four counting zero. Then you can write the multiplication of operator in uh, so all those uh, all those idempotents should be linear independent in pairs of course if you have linear dependence it should be uh, the same idempotent and this is forbidden okay so uh, that's why uh, you can write each multiplication in the corresponding pair as a basis and then you have this lambda one appearing uh, corresponded to eigenvalue of this multi uh, multiplication by C1 is here. And lambda 2 will be uh, an element of the spectrum of C2, and lambda 3 will be element of uh, multiplication by C3. So you have this table from the very beginning, which contains not six elements, just three elements, OK? That's why, this why it's very rigid in a, in, in a sense. You cannot write alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon here. You must have. Uh, two repeated constants. And by the way, those lambda are not one especially, okay? So if we denote by multiset, multiset, this could be repeated, uh, the same element. The spectrum of multiplication operator by another potency i, then it, have, it has two values, one and lambda, and those lambda are here. So you can recognize the eigenvector, uh, and you have this table, I will use it after a while. So, and now I suppose that we have three regular other importance, okay? So, uh, or what is actually a characterization to have exactly three regular other importance in a commutative algebra? So, suppose we have C1, C2, C3, three distinct non zero other importance in two dimensional subspace. Now we have an algebra, a commutative algebra of any dimension. Okay, so we have two-dimensional subspace and three idempotence line is two-dimensional subspace. Then V must be a subalgebra of algebra A, and either of these two foreign alternative holds. First, V contains exactly three non-collinear idempotent C1, C2, C3, non-collinear, so to speak, not line on some line. Or actually you have C1, C2, C3 are both, uh, all three are singular idempotents. The second, the line which uh, goes through C1, C2 contains all idempotents, all possible idempotents in, in, in this subspace V, this subalgebra now V. And C1 minus C2 is two nil potent. This is more or less folklore, and uh, for some different situation, it appears, for instance, in uh, the same already mentioned uh, paper of Sebastian Walker. But you can prove it in Walker worked with uh, algebraic closed fields. So one have to be a little bit careful for a general situation, but here is a proof. 
So what I try to emphasize is that if you have three adipotent in a two-dimensional subspace, it forces the subspace to be as a algebra. This is very nice property, I think. And then you have a dehatome in two cases. Either you have some regular situation or very non-regular singular situation, okay? Uh, so I will need this equation after well on the next slide. Uh, so this cubic equation on three quantities. So we have a field, uh, say we have three elements of fields, three numbers, and this triple we say is uh, is belonging to lambda capital, if and only if this equation satisfied. This is equation uh, of some specific nature. So look, we have the following properties, elementary properties, of course, but they work uh, in an important way when you study two dimensions. So suppose you have a triple of lambdas which satisfy this equation. Then you can rewrite this in this way. This is important because this factor appears to be some specific determinant in your computations. And you want to know if the determinant, determinant here, determinant will be zero, what could be a consequence? And you see, if this determinant is zero, then one, at least one of this lambda should be one half. So this means if you have three lambdas that define this equation and this factor is equal to zero, then at least one lambda should be one half. Okay. So you have the second property. Either all lambda, all three, are this thing from one half, or at least two of them are one half. Not one, exactly two, at least. Uh, next, if you have one half on two places, then for any lambda, this satisfies this equation. And you can rewrite this equation for all lambda distinct from, from one half in this way. In this way. This is equivalent up to this condition. So what we have, we have this first result, we uh, formulated with Yakov uh, in 2018 in the following way. So uh, this result doesn't require any requirement for the ground field except for characteristic not equal to two, and it has some specific nature. So listen, let A be a commutative algebra over field of dimension two. Suppose we have three distinct non-zero idempotents. Denote by lambda E the non-trivial element of the spectrum. It can occur to be equal to one, of course, but it should be next to one. Okay? Then this triple satisfies this equation. This triple satisfies this equation. Okay? So you cannot choose the arbiter. Okay? And uh, the point here is you don't know about some uh, existence. And so all okay, the proof is rather elementary. You just work with the third and important, try to put it in uh, basis decomposition. So you try to work out some conditions. Here's a proof. I, I will not stay here. But the point is that under very weak assumptions, you can prove, uh, yeah, from me, my point of view, not great result, of course. This is an elementary result. But if you try to do something similar in three dimension, I, I think it will be uh, hard, hardly difficult. Okay? So, uh, but still, you can have, and you have there. But the same proof doesn't work, and I have no idea how to work. We 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 try to work out some uh, uh, approaches to three dimensionals. I, I will not discuss, but uh, instead I will show some examples instead. Okay. So uh, we have another result, and this result explains some equivalent situation. Okay. So. Uh, Suppose we have a two-dimensional algebra A over a field and three distant regular non-zero adempotents. Observe that in the previous result, you don't assume that those adempotents are regular. They could be uh, whatever they want. Okay, So uh, 
some idempotent can have uh, eigenvalue one half, for instance. That's why this formula and the next formula are different. They are almost equivalent, but different. Then you have the equivalent setting of writing the previous formula. First, those three idempotents should be balanced by this equation. So here is scalar equation. Here is a vector equation. Okay. Moreover, if you have a any triple of those, okay. So for instance, k is equal to one, e two, and j is three. Then you can express the third adempotent as the square root of the previous one. Okay. This looks very interesting, and I have no good explanation why. It is maybe somebody knows. So I, I will welcome all comments after talk, or uh, just send them to me if you recognize something and you see that it should be mentioned something. Okay, I will be uh, appreciate everything. That is. There are exactly three non-zero idempotents in this algebra. If you have three distinct regular, there are nothing more. There are no two nil potents elements. Of course, those two conditions one can prove for algebraically closed field by uh, tools of algebraic geometry. But uh, for any field, it's difficult. Uh, I mean, not prove the difficult. I mean, uh, it's difficult, for instance, in three-dimensional case. I have no idea how to do it. Uh, and C1, C2, C3 should be non-collinear. Okay? Here is explanation and the proof. And this motivates the definition of generic algebra. This is the definition I uh, explain. So uh, n dimensional algebra is called generic if it contains to the power n distinct regular idempotents. Again, an algebra, commutative algebra, is said to be generic if it contains exactly the zoo number 2 to the power n possible distinct regular idempotents. Uh, actually, this is a very weak definition. And my hope that if you have this definition, you can repeat all uh, those results known for algebraically closed, closed, closed fields for any field, for reasonably uh, included field. Of course. So you have immediately by previous theorem that a two-dimensional algebra is generic if and low if it contains three distinct regular non-zero important. Okay? So this is equivalent definition. But uh, I don't know even the answer on the question if we have two to the power n uh, distinct regular adipotents, if there exists any adipotent uh, over arbitrary field. Uh, it's expected, of course. But uh, the proof is unknown. When k is a complex number or algebraic fields, field, uh, one can prove the equivalence between uh, classical definitions. So, for instance, that a generic algebra doesn't contain two nil potents, or this result was already done for algebraically closed field in the same paper of Barker. So many Excel algebras, excluding Jordan type with e equal to one half, are generic. Many, not all, of course, but many of them are generic algebras. One can uh, see by expectation. I believe that uh, many invariant algebra for sporadic finite simple groups as monster algebra should be generic. Why? Because there are no presence of one half in the spectrum of generating idempotents. Of course, you have huge number of idempotents in such algebras. But if you generate an algebra with uh, peer spectrum, um, which doesn't contain one half, it should be very strange to have one half for other idempotents. But this, of course, a motivation or just even an idea. I believe that uh, those algebras should be generic. Uh, and by expectation, many of them are actually generic algebras. But uh, one would have some conceptual proof instead of expectation. If A is generic actual algebra, then automorphism 
group is finite. This is a very recent result inside of a bigger paper by Gershkov, McEnroy, Shumba, Mozzini, and Spektrov. Uh, an example of non-generic algebra is any commutative algebra that is fine and non-trivial at the end. I already mentioned that before. I just ask, uh, may I have some three, five minutes uh, instead of my... Uh, sure, sure. Okay. Uh, so we have the, some several uh, examples I will mention and just show how this uh, works. Uh, so we have an algebra, the commutative algebra of dimension two, just just uh, by component wise multiplication. This is just a field, uh, direct squared field by component wise multiplication. Then you have exactly four idempotents, three non-zero idempotents here. So uh, you can see that this works, of course, this is trivial. Then a very common example here, example four, Harada Xiang algebra. Harada uh, constructed the bigger family, but this example also comes in another family, Xiang algebra, which I was has been studying for a long time. The so-called algebras of minimal cones coming from differential geometry. That's why I'm calling this Harada Xiang algebra. So this is a two-dimensional algebra generated by three idempotents subject to this condition only, okay? If we allow to be algebra two-dimensional and have three idempotents, then you immediately can recover that uh, all those idempotents are regular. They have eigenvalue minus one, except one. And here how... Uh, those two equations were well, what I tried to show how these two equations work, okay? The scalar equation is a vector equation. And just to um, show you how it works, okay? Those two equations, okay? So here is another equation, non-generic. So this is uh, a three-dimensional algebra generated by four idempotents subject to the following condition. Any pair squared is a tunnel potent, so to speak. This holds for any pair uh, of these indices. Then one can prove that the foreign pairs decomposition holds, and you don't have one half in the spectrum. But this is still non-generic because you have nil potents, okay? Uh, two nil potent elements. And you have at most four idempotents. If you have such an algebra, then you have totally four. If you start with four, so you can prove that there are actually four. Uh, this shows that there are non-generic algebra with only non-singular regular idempotents, by, but they are for few to have a generic algebra. So, so to speak, there are some different uh, situations one have to work out to have some conclusions, okay? Some motivations and so forth, okay? So, and the next example is a mix of generic and non-generic, the so-called three-dimensional Matsuo algebra. This is an algebra spent by three ad importance, three-dimensional, uh, subject to this condition with a free parameter alpha in the uh, ground field. And if alpha is distinct from my from one, minus one and one half, then you obtain a generic unital algebra, okay? And uh, so uh, one can describe all the importance and so on. And for two exceptional cases, if alpha is equal to one half, then it corresponds to infinitely many idempotents lying on a circle, this circle, or if you have in another exceptional case, minus one, then I have exactly three non-zero idempotents and also one dimensional zero subalgebra to nil port, okay? So, so to speak, there are some differ, di, 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 different uh, combinations. And here is uh, the most interesting example from my point of view. So we have the so-called medial isospectral algebra recovered uh, by me and Krasnov first in very 
complicated way. And then we discovered that it can be obtained as an inner isotope. And then also we discovered that it can be obtained some certain denutilization of uh, three-dimensional unital associative commutative algebra and so on. Okay. So uh, by our old definition, this is an algebra such that we have three idempotents C1, C2, C3, such that those black equations satisfied with a certain gamma, which satisfies this equation, the so-called Klein integer unit. And this gamma can be written as this sum if you suppose that this zeta is the I missed to write seven here. This zeta is a primitive root of degree seven of unity. Then this gamma should be a root of this equation. If you have a field, for instance, complex numbers or finite field, which contains this epsilon gamma, then you can construct these formal three idempotents by these rules. And you can prove that these products will be a posteriori idempotents also. You denote them by C5, C7, C, C6, C7. And you also can prove that this will be an idempotent too. Then you obtain totally seven non-zero idempotents. You obtain a generic algebra. You can prove that. And all the potent will have the same spectrum. They will be, so, so to speak, this is isospectral algebra. All seven of the potent have the same uh, cyclotomic spectrum satisfying uh, this uh, circle equation of degree C. This algebra is generic. You also can prove that those seven and potent are very nicely uh, form a quasi-group by multiplication. And this multiplication uh, is medial. When you multiply by pairs, so you can switch between different orders, okay? So this is a medial quasi group which satisfy this identity. There are much more known about this algebra. So uh, I have not so much time, but I mentioned this uh, explanation. The previous algebra so can be isomorphically obtained as follows. Okay, so we have proposition two. Uh, the previous algebra, isospectral algebra, is isomorphic to isotope of an associative algebra here. So uh, here is a polynomial algebra, associative, commutative, unital algebra, factored by this uh, circle polynomial. With new multiplication, when you substitute uh, a primitive root of degree three, and you switch the standard multiplication by epsilon. This new multiplication is no longer associative, but it's medial. And you can prove that this new algebra is isomorphic to the previous one, okay? This is just another representation. And uh, so we have some several questions. Uh, certainly I have to stay here somewhere, okay? But, um, so first of all, if we work in over general field, not algebraically closed, if you know, for instance, you have two to the power two to the power n regular depotents, how many you have uh, except for those regular depotents? Expected number is zero. So you expect that if you have two to the power n regular depotents, that it's all. But the proof for non algebraically closed field is absent, or I'm not aware about that. Uh, do there are any tunnel potents in such situation in uh, generic algebra? I don't know answer in general, but of course in algebraically closed, it's uh, uh, no. Is any proper subalgebra is generic? It's a good question. Uh, and for algebraically closed, it's uh, the answer is yes. But in general, it is unclear what one can expect, and probably some pathological situation could exist. 
uh, you already have some several questions here. And I just uh, finish by this theorem, this result just mentioned here. This is a result from the same paper, the same paper for, with Yakov. He the proof if you have a generic algebra over complex numbers or over a subfield over complex of co complex numbers, and if you denote by idm zero of the set of all the potents, including zero, then if you have some polynomial map H of degree less than dimension of the algebra. Then this sum will be zero if you summing over all and importance. Here are characteristic polynomial of multiplication operators, operators of uh, multiplication by C and the potent evaluated in one half. For instance, you have a balanced equation and you have also very nice condition. So uh, the spectra of idempotence are not arbitrary. They should be balanced by this uh, CZ relation. And I plan to explain more, but uh, unfortunately, I, I should stop here. But uh, yeah, one can uh, look on my slides after. Okay. Thank you very much, Vladimir, for your interesting talk. Are there any questions or comments? I, I I want to make Please. a comment not on the mathematical content. Uh, I'm uh, I'm currently at uh, Barilan where uh, Yakov Krasnov spent uh, almost his entire career uh, since the early nineties, uh, and uh, so I came because of the topic. I didn't know that the the the, 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 the lecture would be related to him, but it was very pleasant to see that uh, his name is mentioned. Uh, he passed away about half a year ago. Um, and he was uh, always an, an, a quiet and excellent uh, colleague, very devoted to his student, gave uh, very well accepted uh, courses. So I, I, it's it's really a pleasure to see that his uh, mathematics uh, is is alive. Yes, thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Very much. Yeah. So Yakov was a very active person until uh, the end. And even having some analytical background, he tried to do so much in this uh, non stiff algebra area. Okay, so I very pity that. Okay, any other comments or questions? Uh, let me see who the chat. Okay, so we don't have any other questions. So thank again, Vladimir, for the interesting thank talk. You. And uh, we will resume on next Monday at the usual time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.